Hello and welcome to lesson number nine of our series, The Traditions of Men versus the Will of God. Uh, this lesson is the next to the last lesson. We'll end next week with lesson 10. Uh, it's always good to, to know that there are viewers out there watching and I uh, appreciate your time so much. Today's lesson is entitled Once and Done and it involves a topic that is just uh, kind of interwoven in the fabric of our religious world today that to the point that we sometimes just don't even realize it's there this idea is there but as we've been doing the last few weeks we're going to start with a, a scenario as if someone had spoken these words to you and it, and it kind of gets our minds on track of what we're speaking of today it says when i was in college i roomed with a nice guy from alabama who was the son of a preacher there he and I did some things back then that I'm not too proud of. In fact, I just stopped going to church after college. I asked him one time if he was not concerned that he might spend eternity in hell for the things he did. And he told me, no, I confessed my faith in Jesus a long time ago, back at my daddy's church, and he always said that my belief in Jesus as the Son of God was what saved me. Because of that decision, I will be going to heaven. God's grace saved me. I met his daddy one time, and he seemed like a really nice man. I believe in Jesus, and I was baptized into my church back when I was in junior high. If Reverend Smith told his son he is saved, that ought to be good enough for me, too, shouldn't it? In, in the mid-1970s, when the idea of church-sponsored ladies' days and women's retreats seemed to be in its infancy, I attended my first ladies' retreat. I'm dating myself. I would not be able to find the location that this retreat was held if my life depended on it. It was somewhere sort of in southwest of the Metroplex. I do remember that it was a ra rather primitive encampment and uh, it had cinder block dormitories and really few amenities. I don't remember a lot of the amenities that were there and there were lots of ladies. We had good attendance and I'm sure there was quite a bit of hairspray being sprayed in the 1970s. But I do remember standing at a window. The group I was with had arrived early and we were standing at a window looking out and seeing car after car pull up with more ladies and I remember commenting rather tongue-in-cheek that this would be sort of like what heaven would be like when we would all look with anticipation on each new arrival. I also do not remember our guest speaker's name, but I do remember that she was a tall, elegant Christian woman who really served us up a beautiful spiritual feast for that Friday and Saturday. A couple of years after this event, we were planning a ladies' day that would be held at the church building, and her name came up again, this speaker. And her name came up as a possible speaker for this upcoming event. But to my dismay, she could not be considered as our speaker because she had walked away from the church. She had gone back into the world. She had abandoned her faith. You know, we all can tell stories of people that have done such things. I remember a couple of years ago in a Christian publication reading about a minister's wife who had served beside her husband for over four decades. And at his death, not long after he died, she walked away. She gave up the church. She went back into the world to never return as far as I know. You know, it's just astounding that people would make that decision. But you know, the Bible tells us an event that we're all probably pretty familiar with that kind of sets the pace for our discussion. And the first mention of this person is made in Colossians 4.14, where he's a companion, he's, he's with, he's a co-worker of the Apostle Paul, and that's a man by the name of Demas. He's not mentioned again until 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. And Paul mentions his name in a whole different context because he uses it, he, Demas, he calls out Demas 
in using this phrase, He has forsaken me. Having loved the present, this present world. What a sad commentary for someone. You know, I, I wasn't there. But you can imagine being a co-worker beside the Apostle Paul. It took a lot of energy and a lot of focus and a lot of commitment. And this, miss, this man named Demas had turned and walked away from it all. You know, it's always astounding and quite mind-boggling, really, how a faithful follower of Christ can just forsake what was so, once so dear to him or to her. In a like manner, it is astounding how someone who professes to be a Christian can live their lives in total disregard for the commandments of Jesus and even sometimes show a level of contempt for the church that Jesus purchased with his blood. And perhaps the most sad of all, many of these absentee believers in Christ will say with confidence that God will save them in the end since somewhere in the distant past they followed the required steps to become a Christian therefore they walk through life assured that God will save them traditions of men have taught millions that only a belief and a quick prayer will seal one's heavenly home their, their eternal fate and they cite such verses as John 3.16 and they are convinced that their lifestyle and entanglement in the world will never take the assurance of heaven away once they profess their belief in Jesus. But hopefully, like we've done in all of these weeks of lessons, we've got to stop and say, but what does God say about this topic? We're going to start today, and there again, I hope you brought your Bibles. We're going to start today with a reading in two readings, two passages in the book of 1 John. First, we're going to look at 1 John chapter 3, if you'll turn with me there. 1 John chapter 3, beginning in verse 6. And it says, Whoever abides in Him, capital H, speaking of Christ, whoever abides in Him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen Him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he, capital H, is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Verse 9, Whoever has been born of God does not sin. For his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin, because he has been born of God. And now turn one page back to 1 John chapter 1. We're going to read verses 5 through 10. And it begins like this. This is the message which we have heard from him, Christ, and declare to you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. You know, we read this verse I believe it was last week when we talked about infant baptism. There, that God is light and in Him there's no darkness at all. If we say then we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as He, capital H, is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. In verse 9, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if we say we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. You know, these, these two patches are in the, the same book, and yet they could not seem to be any more polar opposite. In fact, when it, at a first glance you read these and you think, well, this presents quite a conundrum for this discussion of once and done. They seem to, to contradict one another. You know, all rational believers in God and those who understand there is a heaven and a hell all would agree that sin is the problem. If sin had never been introduced to the world, 
we wouldn't be having these lessons that we're having. If, if man was incapable of sin or there was just, just no sin, we wouldn't need the Christ to hang on the cross for us. I think everyone that believes in Christ and Christianity would understand that concept. Sin is what prevents all people from going to heaven for eternity. And I mean that all is literally everyone. Sin keeps people from heaven. When you compare these two passages we just read in 1 John, on one hand it seems that believers cannot sin, therefore there is nothing to be held accountable for. That chapter 3 passage it seems like sin is impossible to the true believer. However, on the other hand, it makes it clear in chapter 1 that followers of Christ must be in that word fellowship, must have that close association with Him to have their sins forgiven on an ongoing basis. Few honest people would proclaim that they do not sin, but many are deeply ingrained with the belief that they cannot lose the benefits found in the blood of Christ. Let me say that again. There are many who believe they cannot lose the benefits found in Christ once they have taken on Christ. Once a person is truly saved, they believe, they are always in a saved condition. You know, to, to confirm this or to look at this rationally, there's basically two statements that must be confirmed using God's Word, not the traditions of men, using God's Word to challenge this tradition of men. We're going to look at several verses, in fact 16, we won't read each one, but we will address each one. I think we're going to read five or six of them to illustrate what God feels about this idea of once saved, always saved. And the two statements that must be confirmed are these. First of all, people deceive themselves if they think they do not sin and if they think they're not held accountable for sin. We must prove that in God's Word. They perceive sin was only in their life pre-Jesus. Romans 3.23, that very familiar verse. You know, all have sinned and fall short, present tense, fall short of the glory of God. Pretty, pretty straightforward statement. You know, that wasn't written to unbelievers. That wasn't written... To proclaim on the street corners that was written to the Roman New Testament church they were they were written to Christians that we all fall short and the second statement that must be analyzed and confirmed is it is possible to fall from God's grace even after you're once covered with the blood of Jesus it is possible to fall from that covenant relationship that fellowship with Christ we must confirm using God's word that G Christians can lose contact with the cleansing blood of Jesus if they continue in sin. And, and let's, let's emphasize that word. If they continue in sin, totally neglecting and ignoring God's commandments. So let's look at some of the verses that, we've, that I've chosen for today. And we're not going to turn there, but if you'll write down, if you're taking notes, Acts 1.25. And this is... This is the, of course, Acts 1 is when that 12th apostle was chosen to go with the 11 after Judas had walked away from Christ, had betrayed him. And, of course, we know he committed suicide. And it says here that Judas, an apostle, fell from grace by transgression. You know, I realize Judas was not under the New Covenant. He was a, a Jew. He was under the old law at that time because the church had not been established. He lived while Christ was still alive. And just like Jesus, he was under the old law. But yet, he was handpicked. He was chosen by the Savior himself and walked with him at least around three years, day and night, and was one of his closest apostles and, and went most places at Jesus and heard everything that Jesus said spoke and all the miracles he performed and yet he turned his back on it all for money basically 
And we know that was not a good end. So you have to say to yourself, will Judas be in heaven? No. As far as we know, there's no, there's no reason to believe that he would be there. He fell from grace because of transgression. Another passage to write down is Hebrews 12, 14 and 15. The Hebrew Christians, again, these are not unbelievers. These are Christians were admonished to look carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Another passage is 1 Corinthians 10, 12 through 13. The Christians, there again, at Corinth, were told to be careful lest they fall. And then a passage we're going to look at, Galatians 5, 4, if you'll turn with me there. <coughs> I can find it. I had it marked here. Galatians 5, 4. It says, You have become estranged from Christ. Again, who is he writing to? Paul is writing to the churches of Galatia, that area in Asia. And he says, You, you Christians, have become estranged from Christ. Who you attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. Ladies, that can't be much more clear than that. These were Christian people that had sinned and fallen and pulled away to the point that Paul recognized them in this letter, that you have fallen from grace. And another verse we're going to look at is in Matthew. Matthew, this time it's Matthew 13. And we're going to begin in verse 40, in three verses, 40, 41, and 42. In verse 40 it says, and this, of course, this is a, Jesus is still alive, and this is a parable of Jesus. It's called the parable of the tares. And he go on, and, and, he, and he, if you look back up in the parable, he's talking about a field is the world, and the good seeds are the, are the sons of the kingdom, the church, and the tares are the sons of the wicked one, the tares representing weeds or thorns or bad things. And it says in verse 40, Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be in the end of age. The Son of Man will send out His angels and they will gather out of His kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Look at that again. Jesus is saying there will be a time to come at the end of time when tares have grown with the good in the kingdom, the church. And that the Son of Man, Jesus Himself, will send His angels and they will gather out of His kingdom people who profess to be believers, those that offend. You know, it paints a picture that even people that we might sit beside, ourselves even, you might consider yourself very religious, but if you continue in sin and you, you sow discard and you, you cause evil to come into the church, into the kingdom, then Jesus, you're not going to fool anyone. Jesus says, I will pluck you out and I will cast you aside. And of course, the very description here where there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth very descriptively tells us that he's talking about eternal hell. But they're not going to turn to Romans 8, but Romans 8, 12 through 13, even the Christians at Rome were told that they would spiritually die if they lived according to the flesh. This chapter is, is devoted to remaining separate from the world. As Christians, we, should, we have to live in the world, but we don't have to be of it, partake of it. And that's what, G, that's what Paul is warning the Christians at Rome, that you can become so entrenched that you spiritually die. And that has to infer that you were once spiritually alive. And then Revelation 3, 1 through 5, tells us that the Christians at Sardis, you know, the seven churches that, are, that were literal gatherings of God's people. The church at Sardis is warned and they were told to repent and watch and overcome. And it, it tells them that many in that church were not in a good relationship with God, even though they once were Christians. And now let's, let's look at James 5. James chapter 5, 19 and 20 is another very pointed verse on this topic and it says brethren if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back 
Let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. There again, James, the writer, is telling very clearly that Christians can fall away. And it, it infers that if they fall away, they're lost. And it says here that he's admonishing those who go in and, and pull them back from the brink, pull them out of the world. And it says they will save a soul. So obviously these Christians that were once in a saved condition now are no longer in a saved condition. And it says as brethren we should reach out. And that's, a, that's an important verse for all of us, realizing we look around and we see people that have done just what we described at the beginning of this lesson and we do nothing. We sit by and we watch them as they drift back into the world and we do nothing. And this James is encouraging us. We must go out and snatch them out of the fire, if you speak, if, so to speak. And then 1 Timothy... 4, 1 through 3 says a Christian can depart from the faith and should be instructed so that all of these verses are, are spoken to to Christians people that were believers of Christ and followers at one time and then look at 2 Timothy 2 Timothy and here we're going to be looking at 2 Timothy 2 so let's turn there 2 Timothy 2 And we're going to beginning beginning here at verse 16. 2 Timothy 2, verse 16, it says, But shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. For their message will spread like cancer. Hymaeus and Philetus are of this sort, who have strayed concerning the truth saying that the resurrection is already past, and they overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal. The Lord knows those who are His, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. You know, this passage written by the Apostle Paul to that young preacher Timothy actually calls two names. He says, These people have led people astray inside the kingdom, they are, they're practicing false teaching. You could say they're, they're, they're practicing traditions of men, if you will, because it, what they were preaching was not based on God's Word and on his, on his doctrine that the apostles were teaching. And so Paul make it very clear that these people are to be shunned. They're to be remove yourself from because their message will spread like cancer. And boy, if there's any word in the English language that gets our attention, it's that word. And so, yes, these people had fallen away and were no longer in a covenant relationship with Christ. Hebrews 3.12 says Christians can depart from the living God. 2 Peter 3.17 Christians can be led away with the evil, or the error, excuse me, of the wicked. In Revelations 2.4-5, the Christians at Ephesus were told that they had left their first love and were told to repent or they would be removed. There again, this is a group of Christians who had left their first love, which of course is Christ and His church, and they were told, you better turn around, you better come back, or you will be removed. You will not be partakers of the blessings of Christ. And then another verse we'll read is, is 1 Corinthians. This time it's 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 27. And this is Paul speaking to the church at Corinth. We're going to read this one single verse. And it says, But I, talking Paul, I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Here was one of the greatest men of faith. And yet he says, I have to be constant. I have to be diligent. I have to be aware of what I'm saying and what I'm doing, you know, discipline my body and bring it back into subjection, lest I myself be disqualified. Even this great man of faith realized that he could drift and go a direction that would disqualify him from being a Christian, disqualify him from being in a saved relationship. In Romans 11, 16 through 22, says that by our lawlessness we can be cut off from God and then the last verse we'll read and it's really 
not declaring this this statement that we we were looking at today as much as it is just realizing that there is hope there is a way out of such a condition once you have fallen away chapter 8 verse 22 says this and there again this is this is Peter speaking and he's speaking in the context here to an individual by the name of Simon who had become a Christian but he was there again falling back into the old ways he was a by trade he had previously been a uh, I would say a sorcerer or a magician sort of man that's the way he kind of made it and says and when Simon, I mean verse 18, as in when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money. In other words, can I buy this special gift? And Peter rebuked him markedly. And then down in verse 22, he says, Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. So there, once again, not only this shows a Christian who made a conscious decision to, to turn left and go in an evil direction and Peter is admonished him strongly and said you had better repent and of course that word repent means change your mind you better you better have godly sorrow for what you've done and beg God's forgiveness that he might forgive you because Peter's making it very clear the direction you're going is not toward heaven even though he was a Christian from the time of the restoration of the church in the 19th century until the current age those who who strictly follow the New Testament in matters of conversion and salvation have been guilty of living in a constant fear of falling from grace so this is almost the opposite 180 degree difference than many of the other religious world participate but we have been guilty of, of walking on eggshells spiritually for this idea of falling from grace because just like the verses we've read, we realize it can happen. The idea that we feel compelled to use the phrase or phrases such as forgive us of our sins multiple times in a single day or even sometimes in a single prayer demonstrates the high level of diligence given to the requirement of, of of constant forgiveness to be eternally safe. Thankfully, that trend seems to be waning because in truth, in the balance of these two very polarized ideas, one being once saved, always saved, and the other is, I hope before I die I have time to say a quick prayer so that I can spend eternity in heaven. Between those two very opposite ideas, we have to realize that God sent His Son to save us he wants to save us Luke 19 10 states that very well and a beautiful verse 2nd Peter 3 9 that was the whole purpose of Jesus coming to this earth was to save lost souls if we as baptized believers continue to follow his instruction found in the New Testament we have constant contact with Christ's blood which continually cleanses cleanses us you know that first chapter of first john tells us that but we have to walk in fellowship with him there will be no sin in heaven at all so when you think of do i sin absolutely does everyone that walks on this earth sin absolutely can i go into heaven with unforgiven sin absolutely not and so there has to be a condition in which you can become saved and remain saved and that is being in fellowship with Christ through obedience to his gospel and following and walking in the light unforgiven sin causes a person to be rejected from entering heaven it's as simple as that the blood of Christ is the only remedy for sin we must first of all follow God's plan to become in contact with Jesus blood and this lesson was not for the intent of giving that uh, instruction or that plan but we've studied it many times in the last few weeks so hopefully you, you have that at your fingertips if you if you have forgotten but once we follow that plan and come in contact with Jesus' blood then we must live in obedience to him putting aside a sinful life 
And that's where the idea of 1 John 3 comes. If you are a believer in Christ and doing your best to follow Him, you will not willfully sin. You will not make a decision. That's why that verse says you do not sin. In other words, you don't get up this morning and say, well, I was real good on the last four days. Today, I'm going to let my hair down. Today, I'm going to sin. You don't make those decisions. Instead, you make a day-to-day decision. Today, I'm going to try my best not to sin. And those little, uh, and there's no little sin, but those uh, non-willful, non uh, no, that's not your intent to live life in sin. Jesus' blood will forgive us of those sins because He wants us. He, God loves us and He wants us to spend in heaven, eternity with Him. To close our lesson today, we're going to look at a few thought questions. Uh, the first question, we won't answer them all, but the first question is, what is the difference in the sin discussed in 1 John 1, 7 through 10 and the departure from the faith in 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 3? You know, it might be worth our, our time to look. We've already looked at, at the passage in 1 John 1 in walking in the light. Uh, but 1 Timothy 4, if you have time to turn there right quick. 1 Timothy 4. And this is the uh, 1 through 3. It says, Now the, the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused is received with thanksgiving so those verses tell us that there are people that will depart and at that time you know there again Paul was telling this young preacher there's going to be a huge falling away there's going to be an insert if you will of traditions of men and it says in the latter times which ladies we live in the latter times so it's while we're living in other words that it began in the, in the first century but all these 2,000 years this has continued to happen that there's people that are leading us away from the faith, and it's very clear that some depart from the faith. So what's the difference in the two sins? The one that's spoken of in 1 John, you know, that we, we all we know we sin, but we're in contact with the blood of Christ, and the, and the difference is the word willful. The, di- the difference is, is the word, uh, like in this passage, depart. In other words, it's a purposeful action. Purposeful sin is described in 2 Timothy 4. And in 1 John, it is a... Uh, I almost want to use the word accidental sin. It is a slip up. It is a stumble along life's way. And you pick yourself up and look to God and say, forgive me, God, and, and move on. Repent and move on on a continual basis. The second question is, can Christians who willfully sin and wander away come back to a saved condition with repentance and returning to faithfulness? Thankfully, that has to be a resounding yes. But it's that in in mind and and we're grateful for it aren't we but if so which we all agree that that's so what does hebrews 10 26 through 29 mean we're not going to take time to look that up but that's the passage that says there's a point where there's no more sacrifice for sin and and i believe and you may have you know these are thought questions you may have your own thought here but i believe it has to do there again with how far and how deep we are in the sin there comes a point that our hearts can get hard and it speaks of that in Hebrews to the point that Jesus is not going to get back up on the cross. He's, he's, he's done the action necessary to save souls and now the activity, the action, the response is ours. And so there's no more sacrifice. If you give up Christ, there's no more sacrifice. And how does that relate to Galatians 6, 7 through 9? So we might turn to Galatians 6, 7 through 9 in Galatians 6 7 through 9 says let him who is was uh, 7 excuse me do not be deceived God is not mocked for whoever whatever a man sows that he will also reap for he who sows to his flesh will out of the flesh reap corruption but he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life so this passage is saying God is not going to be fooled you know, man can walk through life saying, I was once baptized, I was once uh, added to or, or joined a church, I, and I'm, 
you know, my heart's still there, even though my life's very busy, I, you know, I don't get to go to church anymore, or I work on Sundays, whatever excuse you give, God will not be mocked. He says, you, man will reap what he sows. And, and that's, to me, what that thought question means. And the last thought question is read Romans 6, which we're not going to take time. But there again, that, ver that chapter has a lot to do. You know, it starts out with, should we continue in sin that grace may abound? And it says, God forbid, or definitely no. How does this chapter relate to this discussion that we've just had? Can man boastfully go through life and say the blood of Christ can save me even though I give no response back to God? And it's, it's a sad condition when man says, I did that once and now I'm done. I'm saved and when, when the Gabriel blows the last trumpet, I'll be on God's side. So I think these, we need to look at this rationally and realize that we are accountable for our sin. Even before, certainly before we become a Christian, but after we become a Christian as well. And the key is to, to walk in the light and stay in fellowship with Christ, not willfully and purposely sin. I hope this lesson has helped you and I hope it will help you as you discuss this topic with your friends and your family. Thank you. Thank you.